Hello and welcome to the new episode of Help Me Buy a Property podcast. Now, what we are discussing today is how to find investment grade properties and what due diligence is involved in finding these properties. We've talked about this in the previous episode. This is part two of the previous episode where we are still talking about suburb selection, but we are understanding now the supply side of the suburb. So again, if you're looking for a due diligence checklist, please join in our Facebook group called Property Investment Australia or check out the links in the comments below to get access to that due diligence checklist. The supply of the suburb is an interesting one. A supply of the suburb is basically the amount of properties available to buy in that particular area or rent in that particular area. The higher number of properties available for rent would convert into more stock available in the area, indicating that people do not really want to live in that suburb or this suburb has still time to reach its maturity and growth. My host today, again, Cheryl Leong, and me will be discussing our experience in, in relation to understanding the suburb selection and the supply side of the equation. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the episode for today. So we talked about the demand indicators, which are sort of days on market, um, online search, auction, renters, proportion of renters, and market timing. Let's dive into what are the supply side indicators. Because it's always, you know, economics, demand, and supply. How do we determine how much supply is around? And so when you talk about supply, you're talking about is basically the stock in market, the stock available in the market or the stock that is going to come into the market. Basically, that is the supply that you're trying to understand and identify. And the key thing there to understand there is basically the stock available in the market, which we call it is, is a stock on market. Um, stock on market is a detailed data point which basically indicates the amount of properties that are listed on the suburbs versus total listed properties, total amount of properties available in the suburb. And so... As the stock on market goes up, that's a clear indication that the supply is going higher. And as the stock on market goes down, it's a clear indication that the supply in that particular area is going down. Now, the very important point that I need to make here, people when they're looking at this stock on market, they look at it at a much more suburb level or an LGA level. I say to people, when you're looking at the stock on market, you need to look at it at the cohort that you are going to do an investment in. So if you're going to look for a three bedroom property or a four bedroom property, you need to look at stock on market at that level, okay? Mm. And so an increase in a stock on market for a complementary stock does not mean that the market is bad. It's actually meaning good. So let me use an example to explain this a bit more. So if you're buying in a particular suburb where you're going for land and you're looking for, say, development properties or properties with development potential, um, but you can see that the supply or the stock on market for house and land packages is going higher, Mm. that doesn't naturally mean that your product is bad. It basically means that your product is more scarce because there is less and less of your product available in the market now as people produce more house and land products out there. And so the, the idea of creating a, a smaller price point for a complementary product naturally means that your product is becoming more scarce. And when I say product, I'm talking about investment property. It's becoming more and more scarce. And so in terms of where we would find those numbers, like what do you mean by stock on market? Are we, are we studying realestate.com and domain and going, I'm going to put numbers of there's one four bedroom, there's another four bedroom. Is that, is that how we're counting or is there a smarter, more fancier way of Of determining that where it just goes ping from the market? (laughs) Definitely. There is heaps of, there's heaps of websites that provides you a lot of this data quite openly. Um, We are talking about dsr.com. Jeremy, a great friend of mine, um, he runs dsr.com.au, dsrdata.com.au. There is Suburbs Finder that does really, really well. We all know who runs Suburbs Finder. Oh, um, amazing Gilbert, guy. Yes, yes um, amazing Gilbert. Um, and um, then there is SQM Research. You can get data from there. 
there is domain in real estate as well. Actually, they share a lot of free data as well. You can go out to ABS and get a lot of data as well. And so a lot of this data is available in the shape of paid or free resources, just a matter of getting hands on this data and doing some of this analysis. Of course, it is tedious work. It's not, it's not easy. It's not simple. You need to really, really love data to understand and crack yeah. the code. Yeah. And so for people who don't like numbers or numbers don't talk to them, you know, they can definitely go out and seek some professional help in helping them understand as to what suburbs they're going to look for. You look at a lot of these hotspot reports, a lot of people doing hotspotting. Mm. They are looking at some of this data as well. But again, various hotspot reports looks at data at various levels. And so uh, if, you, if I talk about Terry Ryder, for example, Terry Ryder looks at um, sales and rentals. And those are the two key data that he looks at when he's comparing uh, demand and the supply side of the equation. So amount of sales and amount of listings, those are the two key things. And then the rental that combines together with the, together with the projects that are happening in those areas. And uh, what we are talking about is 30 data points. It's quite intensive. Um, it is a lot of information to comprehend and to understand some of these things. Yeah. And so along with stock on market, you've got to be able to look at what the trends have or the the growth has been over the last, you know, two to three, two to three years. And and yes. what do you say when people are like, you know, past past growth is not a good indicator of future future growth. What are your thoughts around that? Look, that's true. Um, as a generic statement, that is true. Um, but if the past growth is not a good indicator of future growth, then you would never buy anywhere because every suburb shows some sort of past growth, right? And so what is the magical formula that you can quickly disappear that past growth, although has happened, but there is more to come, okay? And so, as I said, when you're looking at the growth that has happened over the last sort of 36 months versus 10 years, an average property over a 10-year in Australian property market would deliver around 5% growth, okay? And so if a market is really, really hot, you would see that 10-year trend sitting at around 8% or 9%, then you know that this market is saturated. You shouldn't be going back yeah. in there, okay? But when you see the 10-year trend and the 10-year and the trend still sits at like 10, 3% or 4%, you know that there is more heat that this market has to yeah. offer. It's and so good. it's not just about the short term, but also looking at the long term. So when you look at the last two years and you see that the market has delivered 15% growth or 20% growth, that does not naturally mean that you discount the suburb completely. You look at the 10-year trend and say, okay, has it delivered more than 6% growth? And if it has, don't touch it, right? You need to let, mm -hmm. because ultimately what tends to happen is a lot of suburbs start getting to its maturity. Once the suburb hits mm -hmm. its maturity, then any growth that is going to come would be in a much more succinct manner. It would be much more subtle in nature. You wouldn't see a million dollar property turning up into a $2 million property in two years time. Okay. And so if I take examples of Point Piper, for example, right? And so you don't see, you know, an $8 million property turning into $16 million property in literally a year's time, right? Because these are mature suburbs. The growth happens in a much more subtle manner. Of course, you know, there are times where people go crazy and go emotional and you've seen times like those, but these areas adjust quite quickly as well. And then, the, you know, they come back to the growth trajectory. What we are talking about is affordable pricing points where we are talking about 400, 350 to I would say about 550, 600 price point where the suburb can actually go from 550 to a million dollars in literally three, three years time. And so how do you pick that? How do you go picking those suburbs where, you know, that sort of growth is going to come. Yeah. And, and I know we're going to, we, you know, we're going to be talking about you know, planning and building approvals and infrastructure as well, because that's one of the things also that can change where, you know, you might have a suburb which might have um, people have had difficulty accessing because of transport or there haven't been any hospitals or schools or whatever that might be. And all of a sudden the, the government's decided, actually, we're going to put a new rail out this way and that's where you know your what, the past trends may not be a good indicator of the future trends because there's been this whole lack of access to a particular area that is now being freed up where people have always wanted to 100%. so have, have you seen you know in your experience have you seen where 
you know, traditionally that might be a suburb where, you know, the growth has been okay. But then with this new infrastructure going in, not necessarily greenfield or growth corridor, but there's new infrastructure going in, that there's then this been a whole shift in the way that that area grows. Definitely. Definitely. Look, opening up the area to an easier access point basically does wonders for an area. The most recent example for people, again, who are in Melbourne would understand that there is a Northeast Link project that came on, went away, came on, went away. And so they finally started building it up. And so that's the link that connects Northeast uh, to basically Southeast. And so, of course, Southeast is the premium of Melbourne. Everyone wants to live in Southeast or the South of Melbourne. Okay. And so, of course, it would always attract a lot of premium people chose to live there. But there were, there were a lot of people who were there in Northeast who wanted to work in Southeast or had options to work in Southeast, but they never could go there because it was such a long journey. Even from a train's perspective, you have to come all the way into Melbourne CBD and then go back. Uh, from a traffic perspective, all the way into Melbourne CBD, come back. Okay? Yeah. And so the yeah. Northeast Link basically reduce that journey or is going to reduce that, you know, 55 to an hour journey to like literally 20 minutes journey. And so you saw that Northeast or Northwest, you know, just taking off like crazy. You know, I remember, or I, I still know that I have two development projects in that area, like around Diamond Creek, Eltham, Greensboro. And uh, we were assuming resales of around $830,000 and the resales on some of these properties are now to around 1.1, 1.15. And I cannot believe how quick the growth has come in some of these areas as people realized that this is what the impact is going to look like. Same with train lines, you know. And so airport rail in Melbourne has done amazingly wonders, right? You look at Sunshine, Sunshine West, Albion, yep. Deer Park. You know, people used to never even talk about these suburbs, you know. Um, and people used to say, oh, this is low socioeconomic suburbs. And then all of a sudden, boom. It just went through the roof as soon as the government has announced these, these infrastructure projects. What's important is there are two types of infrastructure projects. There is one infrastructure project that is high impactful, that is going to change the dynamics of the area completely. And then there are second type of infrastructure projects where they are changing a one lane road to a two lane road or a two lane road to a three lane road. Okay. And so those are not impactful projects. And so when people talk about infrastructure projects, I say to people, look at either high impactful infrastructure projects like building a massive hospital, like Footscray yeah. Hospital. You know, it, has, it would do wonders to Maidstone and Braybrook. You would see that coming through that would just completely change the dynamics of Maidstone and Braybrook. And so impactful infrastructure or when you're talking about infrastructure, it has to be consistently delivered infrastructure, which basically brings in uh, growth opportunities from population, growth opportunities from jobs. And so people tend to move in these areas because there is consistent infrastructure that is happening in those areas. Okay. And so yeah. those are the two yeah. things that really defines and drives, you know, some of these areas while the supply is limited in those particular areas and the demand is high and infrastructure could do one this. Yeah. And then let's move into an area about rentals. Rentals, it's on the top of everyone's mine at the moment because the rental market is tight as a bee's bottom. Um, I don't know where that term came from, but it sounds good. <laughs> Which means that it's driving a lot of rental prices. Poor tenants are, are screaming blue matter around how basically you've got, you've got properties which are increasing $50, $100 a week very, very quickly. So how much of rental growth drives price property growth as well? Look, I would say this, that an increase in rent is the first sign of there is something happening in that suburb. Okay, So before a price rise happens, usually the rent rises. And so the increase in rental demand, which basically substantially increases the rent prices or rental prices in the area, gets reflected into the prices with the six months lag. And the reason, and it's not always the case, but it's, it's majority of the time it's the case. And the reason is that a hot rental market indicates that people want to live there. Mm. And so if people want to live there, then naturally, if it's an owner-occupier market, there is only a handful of people who are living there. Okay, And so 
if there are a few affluent people who are renting there, naturally they will transition into buying a place there because they'll be like, oh, this rent is crazy. It keeps going up. How about we just buy the property here? And so if it's 75% controlled by owner occupier who's never going to sell anyway, and there's only 25% of investors who are literally there, that creates an automatic pressure on people converting from rental to owner occupier, pushing the prices up slowly and gradually. You see this typically in school zones, really, really sharply in school zones, especially around January. Like I know, or should I say, especially around January, February, when the new term is starting, right? And so you would see school zones where suburbs basically shoot, shoot through the roof, be it prices or buying in those suburbs or rent. And so you would see this, you know, consistent amount of rent growth that happening in these school zone areas. And so people would just go crazy. They would go emotional in buying in some of these areas because they know that this is never going to stop. Yeah. And you know, seeing that we're we're moving soon and I'd say one of the people to really talk to around where people are moving to, because we don't, you know, unfortunately we don't have this huge map but we can see the live movement of people and migration. But you know who can? It's yeah. the removalists. The removalists oh, yeah. know where people are moving to. And and they're seeing the trends live because they're physically moving people from one place to another. And so removalists are really good in the, if you want to be talking to professionals and all that. Of course, you're already talking to real estate agents, but real estate agents are very much this is my suburb that I know, right? Whereas if you're talking to large removalist companies, I sit down with them and go, hey, where are people moving from and moving to? And what are the times that they're doing that? And why are they moving? And and you get some really interesting insights into like, the, the movement of people as well. So I think that's a really good one. Like I said, you know, we're, we're moving and it's just been interesting talking to a removalist. And I'm like, where are people moving to and from? And, and then sort of take that information and, and do a bit of data research yourself because then, and what we find as well is people are going to be moving into places where they want to live, but they'll probably rent to begin with before they decide Definitely. to buy. Yeah. Definitely. So it's and, all and human psychology there as well. Definitely. And to your point, I think a lot of these, I call them people who are, supporting your transaction you know we've talked about the team previously they provide so much value like even if you're not looking at the data just talking to a building and pest inspector or talking to a local real estate agent uh, or a rental manager provides immense amount of information to you like i remember when we first started investing in Adelaide, um, i was talking to a real estate agent there um, who had a massive rent roll and I was saying, oh, so what are you looking at? And he's like, oh, I can see the rents climbing up. You know, there is pressure yeah. building up in this, 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 this area. And so they'll talk to you about these. Uh, you're building in pest inspector as you build up rapport and relationship with them. Yeah. He'll call you and say, hey, have you thought about this suburb? I'm doing all of a sudden a lot of building in pest inspections here. Do you know something is happening here? What is happening here? And so you're making exactly the right connection that, you know, there is a lot of these peripheral people who would provide you a lot of insights that, you know, if you think about it, you would realize that, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it is basically the demand and supply that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And so what are the other things, you know, where we've, we've highlighted a lot of supply indicators? What are some other ones that we haven't really thought about to sort of go, oh, right, I can see where, you know, there's not the enough supply. Lands, yeah. The developable land. land supply and the building approvals and the planning approvals, I think that's another one which is quite key because you can see in a particular area how much stock is being made available, be it now, be it in the future. And so you can see what sort of incoming developable land, for example, is coming in an area that you have no clue of or incoming, you know, building approvals where a developer is building, you know, states, for example. And so those are some of the key indicators as well as to how much developable land is available around the area. And so you see areas where there's a lot of green field around you, you know that this land would be developed at some stage. And so even if the market is tight right now, what you need to check is, hey, is there a developer who holds all of these properties and they might turn the tap on one day and decide to 
you know, basically develop all these properties in one go. And so that would basically saturate the market. And so as an investor, when you're buying the property, you might decide to buy in a particular suburb thinking that the, sub, the, the demand is high, supply is low. But what you also need to keep a close eye on is that there might not be an incoming supply that might turn on in the next 12 to 24 months. It happens in Perth quite often and quite quickly because Perth is uh, quite diverse. And so there are pockets and pockets of land which has never been developed. And there are other areas which are quite super developed. And so you see areas where you see demand is super high and the supply is super low. And you're like, oh yeah, I should buy here. All the numbers make gives me a tick and there's a good story to tell. But then all of a sudden you see this massive greenfield area. And as soon as you look at these greenfield areas, you realize that there is three developers who have planning applications in the council right now. And they are going mm -hmm. to bring in more than thousand lots in the next sort of two years. And you know that as soon as these lots start coming in the area, they're going to flood the market and basically bring the prices to back to the equilibrium. And it wouldn't, you know, the demand would not translate into higher prices because people would see this supply coming through. And so, so that's a very, very important thing when we are talking about the supply side of things. The other things that you briefly touched about, Cheryl, was, and we've talked about this as well, is um, the qualitative due diligence when you're talking about the suburb selection. So you're talking about housing commissions, you're talking about school rankings, you're talking about transport, shopping center. Australia has this love to the beach, so coastal line, you know, how much, how close or far is the beach? changing in income levels and so one of the reasons that you are moving to queensland right you know that's exactly the reason you know you want to be closer to the beach right so there is this love for beach for people to basically be closer to the beach so yeah and so there are these qualitative factors that you need to consider you talk about income level changes you talk about mortgage affordability you talk about rental affordability Employment rates, unemployment rates, and neighborhood character. People don't tend to put a lot of focus on neighborhood characters. Activities for the council, that's, that's very, very important as well. So you can get a lot of information from the council as to what their plans are for particular suburbs. To what are they planning to do? Uh, of course, state activities are important. And, you know, you would get that information on what projects the states are doing through state budgets. But council activities play a big part as well. You know, they might create one road that basically unlocks this particular suburb completely out of the blue. And, you know, councils tend to do that. They don't tell you. And <laughs> they would do that. And next thing you know, that this new pocket has all of a sudden come up that yeah. has better access to free, better access to school. Mm -hmm. School zones tends to do that. They'll change a the school zone, you know, in a, in a very cheeky way. I know um, this person, this very good friend of mine who bought it in a school zone right at the curb of the school zone, I kept telling him, no, don't do that. That's a mistake. It's cheap because it's at the curb. If you are going to buy in a suburb because you want to be in a school zone, buy in the heart of the school zone. And he bought there. And I think a year later, they changed the school zone. And so they cut him out. Um, and so, you know, his one kid goes to one school and the other kid goes to another school. And there was a lot of CF around it. And so, you know, it, it creates a lot of pressure when a particular school is doing really, really well. And so you're buying in that pocket. You would potentially pay more than $100,000, $250,000 in some areas where schools are really, really top notch just to enter into that suburb. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs>